let's just start out with housing uh, right now. And we're getting reports from Kay Schiller, from the corporate media, from the government that, you know, housing prices, they're just going through the roof. And the last time we saw this was back in uh, 2007, 2008, where prices were continually climbing, climbing, climbing. Do you believe that the housing market is in a bubble right now, or is this normal what we're seeing? No, I mean, I think it's definitely a not just a bubble, but a hyper bubble along with stocks. But with the real estate market, look, I mean, back in 2011, I, I produced a uh, documentary short titled House of Cards, Real Estate Big Secret, where uh, I basically laid out everything that has happened. You know, this is something that I do for a living. I have for the last 16 years of my life. And so, you know, I knew back then just from being on the front lines of this industry that you had hedge funds and private equities and a lot of very wealthy individuals buying up a lot of distressed debt and properties after the crash. And the intention there, Dave, was to continue to to hold these properties for a period of time and eventually resell them via no money down loans or easy credit subprime loans, which is exactly what's happening now. So you have a lot of different factors um, colluding, if you will. One of them is the big banks have suppressed inventory for prices to go up. Obviously, the Fed keeping rates at 0% for over 10 years has affected housing. And in the last six months, we've seen not only Bank of America, but we've seen Wells Fargo come out with 3% down loan programs where really it's 0% down because of all these different federally funded home uh, buyer assistance programs where you get your down payment in essence for free. So it's just another manipulated market that is is going to end well. I think that crash will likely be um, larger than the one we saw in 2008. Um, and the last factor affecting this is the uh, people freaked out around the world about what's happening economically. I mean, this year alone, you're going to see Chinese investors. And when I say Chinese investors, Dave, mm-hmm. 60% of that's really the Chinese government that is uh, buying a quarter a quarter trillion dollars of U.S. real estate in housing, in uh, commercial apartment buildings, all kinds of different um, uh, you know industry spaces as far as real estate is concerned. So so there's multiple factors that are influencing the market. Um, and yeah, it's I, I believe it's a, it's a hyper bubble. When you say hyper bubble, I mean just explain to the people what you mean by hyper bubble. We've heard bubbles before, but you're using the term hyper bubble. What, what do you mean by that? Well, look, I think a hyper bubble is what, what I mean by that is that right now we have the uh, the real estate market completely on fire. Now, it's not in every single market, Dave, but mm-hmm. if you look at the big metro markets and the kind of surrounding tertiary markets, you see prices upwards of 5, 10, 15 percent, in some cases, double digits from where they were uh, just a few years ago. In addition to that, like states like California, uh, some places in Florida, you've had double digit growth for the last three, four, five years. So it's just an unsustainable track record. You mentioned Kay Schiller earlier. Mm-hmm. You know, in many, many markets, housing prices have surpassed what they were in 2008. So 2008, there was a major bubble. 2007, the crash of 2008 was a major bubble. Now it's not like they, you know, the inventory was swept clean and you had all kinds of all of a sudden free market capitalism that led to another boom in prices. No, they doubled down on the manipulation, creating what I believe is this hyper bubble, a much larger bubble than what we saw back in the 2006 to 2008. Now, you mentioned the, Chi- the, well, the Chinese government is purchasing real estate. Why are they doing this? Is this a safe haven or are they looking to stash cash? Why are they out there purchasing so much real estate? And I should know too, it's not just in the United States. I mean, in Canada, places like Vancouver and Toronto, Dave, you have Mm. home prices. The average, the medium home price in Vancouver is almost a million dollars because you have foreigners, mostly Chinese, that are coming in and they're paying whatever they can just to get, park some cash and get it out of China which is interesting if you think about it. I think many of the listeners listening today, you and I uh, uh, included, Dave, would you know believe that, look, maybe America is not the biggest uh, uh, hedge against 
a global crisis because of the unsustainable debts that are that 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 the U.S. government currently holds. But certainly, people in China and other people in Europe around the world believe America is still a safe haven, and so that's why you're seeing them park money here, not only for the safe haven aspect, but also because they're able to get visas to bring their families over here if they park a certain amount of cash、uh, in the U.S. But I think it's they're trying to preserve wealth, and the way that they see that is by buying real estate. Mostly in affluent markets or bigger metro markets that they believe will hold their value long term. Do you think this bubble was driven by,、uh, like you said, the foreign investors, maybe hedge funds, maybe investment companies? Do you think most of the American people are sitting on the sidelines where they're not actually purchasing, or do you see Americans actually out there purchasing? Well, I certainly see. People that are investors, which I deal with a lot,、uh, buying real estate today. I think that、uh, look, you had you know in, in March you had the largest bump in mortgage applications, and again they're trying to create a situation, a new subprime. I mean, going back to that Wells Fargo、mm. new home loan program, you need a 580 credit score to qualify for it. I mean, a 580 credit score under、That's... any circumstances is pretty horrible. Yeah. So, so they're repeating the the no money down,、um, really the, the the easy financing subprime. The Fed's trying to create a、uh, a, a wealth effect where people, you know, they buy a home, they feel more wealthy. They, they 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 the Fed thinks they'll go out and spend more money. The point is, I think what we've seen is a collusion between mainstream media, central bankers, and Wall Street bankers all colluding, and, and federal the federal government as well, all colluding. To try to boost home prices. Look, you know, I I will often say in my videos, Dave, I'm surprised housing's not talked about more. I look at it as one of the cornerstones of the of of the really the U.S. economy for the simple reason that it's one of the biggest drivers of this total fraud illusion fairy tale that the Fed calls the wealth effect, or what Ben Bernanke called the wealth effect, where they think that. People become a homeowner, and magically they're going to spend more money because they think, you know, wow, I bought a home. It's the American dream. Look how great I am. That experiment has failed horribly. I agree with you. I, I look at real estate also, and I, and I do believe that this is the cornerstone、um, of what is going on here. And I think that's one of the reasons why they had to push the housing prices up because when the people see housing prices go up, they automatically feel that everything is fine. Well, yeah, they they feel everything's、yeah. right. You know, another thing, Dave. In the last three or four months, you've seen refinances,、um, you know, surpassing and hitting new records as far as people refinancing and using their homes as ATMs again. And then, so so yeah, it's. I mean, they're basically repeating the same exact、right. thing that that I believe we saw. But going back to the, the 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 point of the question was, you know, are Americans buying in? Look, the millennial generation, you know, twenties to thirty five year olds in that range. They're the they're the biggest demographic in the United States, and they're saddled many of them with student debt. Many of them can't qualify to buy a home, and the Fed and the U.S. you know go, the, the government politicians want to get this segment, this demographic, to buy homes. And that's where they're targeting for this. What I believe is this next big wave、um, in price escalations that we're going to see. This is exactly what I talked about in that sh- documentary short that I mentioned earlier. The last stage of this, we're already beginning to see it, was a, a rollout of easy financing. So all the big landlords in America, i.e., the hedge funds and private equities and sovereign wealth funds that have bought a ton of real estate, are going to begin to transfer the assets that they purchased and unload them to unsuspecting American home buyers that are able to get cheap financing prior to the crash. Now we already see Sam Zell, where he's out there saying it's time to sell, and he actually did this back in、uh, 2007, going into 2008. Prior to that, a little bit, where he was unloading his real estate. Now I know he has a lot of real estate,、um, but this is an indicator that he's getting out, isn't it, or starting to get out? Well, he's starting to get out. He certainly has said he's no longer buying. Uh, at least at this point in time, he owns thousands and thousands of apartment buildings,、right. apartment units, and so yeah, he's begun to sell in markets like LA and other markets where the prices have just gone absolutely 
you know, kind of like that hockey stick graph where, 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 where they've gone, uh, they've gone vertical. And so he, you know, can't resist. And he's also, uh, talking about what the Fed's doing to housing with its rate policy. So yeah, look, in 2007, 2008, he called it perfectly. He sold a lot of his assets, did very, very well. He's doing the same thing again. And there's other billionaires, and I'm sure we'll get into this as well, but you look at just a Wall Street Journal article last week talking about George Soros buying gold, buying gold miners, being very bearish on the global economy. So Sam Zell's not alone. Uh, what I find interesting is some of these very wealthy individuals, their, their, what, what, their solution varies. I mean, you have Ray Dalio from Bridgewater and Associates talking about we need helicopter money. We need the Fed to print money and to basically give it to big banks to lend out. So it's it's amazing. Even some of the most brilliant economic minds are coming up with solutions that I think are absolutely horrible, may work short term, but long term, they're going to be absolutely horrible. Let's switch gears to what the economy is doing right now. And we know from the beginning of this year, the stock market was down. It's been pushed back up it's floating around and precious metals it went from i think a thousand fifty or so back in december and now it's up into twelve hundred and change the president was out there telling us that actually twice that the economy is perfect it's doing <laughs> well there are no problems whatsoever and at this point in time what's your take on what the economy is doing well, the, the economy is contracting. I'm one of those guys that believe that we over averaged out over the last 10 years. We've likely had negative growth every single quarter. The only thing that bumps it into positive growth, at least on paper, is inflation. Uh, you factor that out and it's been negative growth. I mean, and that's what the Fed continues to try to do, hit a 2% inflation target. And they've tried everything. The only thing you haven't tried is, is this, this notion of uh, helicopter money that I mentioned earlier, that it's completely different from quantitative easing. But look at the jobs report last, you know, last quarter. It was absolutely horrible. And in spite of that, you, you still see the stock market going up or holding its value. It's so amazing that, I mean, that shows you the depths of insanity, Dave, where it's the worse the economic news is, the better the stock market does because investors are like, wow, the feds won't raise rates. I mean, that's what it's come to. Right. Um, it's complete insane. So look, the economy has been completely stagnant. Uh, wages aren't, ra aren't raising. And the simple mad fact of it is, is if they haven't allowed a flushing down the toilet of all the malinvestments that have been created going back 10, 15 years, you know, what they've done is there's a crash. The Fed comes in and they print money. They do all of these measures. Government spends more money to try to boost things and create almost like a zombie economy. What should have been done in 2008 is let the whole thing crash, let banks fail and rebuild off of that. But they'll never do that, unfortunately. I mean, that's the way a real free market economy should work. And that's not what we have today. But I mean, look, the economy right now, it's not doing great for the exception of individuals that own stocks for the exception of individuals that are buying and selling real estate. I mean, it's not all bad everywhere. There's some markets that are doing well and some industries that are doing well. You see the other day, LinkedIn was purchased by Microsoft for something like $32 billion. Uh, so it's not all bad. But when you add in the debt, when you add in the monetary policies of the Fed, it spells an absolute recipe for disaster. Overall, do you think that the U.S. is already in a recession or approaching a recession? Well, I would say that it's really become so so industry specific. But I think overall, the average American is hurting. And you can just see this in the political process. You see the tens of thousands of people that came out for Bernie Sanders, who's talking complete gibberish and I mean, just complete delusions as far as how he feels he can fix the economy, or you see people going out to Trump events because they recognize bad trade deals and a lot of other things government has done has screwed the middle class. So I think that's the biggest indicator for how the economy is doing is the tens of thousands of people that are showing up for these two candidates that are point, pointing 
to systemic problems in the overall economy. So that leads us to what is happening in the UK, where we have David Cameron, we have other officials, because we know the Brexit, the vote is coming up very soon. And they're talking doom and gloom. You know, if, if we leave the euro, we're going to have war, we're going to have a collapse, the, the earth's going to implode. I mean, they're coming up with <laughs> everything they can possibly think of to scare everyone. What What is your take on what would happen if uh, the UK decided to leave the Eurozone? I think if the EU, do, I think if the UK does leave the EU, I think the internationalists at the IMF, the rest of the collection of the EU masters that basically are unelected bureaucrats, um, will try to punish the UK financially to set an example for the other copycats that may want to follow suit. But I think ultimately the UK will be much better. They have they have a an economy that they can rebuild around oil, shipping, insurance, finances, a lot of different things. Their tourism is big. So there's a lot of ways, just like Greece. I mean, look, Greece took three bailouts in five years. And we were all told it's a disaster if they leave. Well, they could have built their economy around mining, around shipping, around tourism. They decided not to do that. Uh, I think it'd be great for the UK. Unfortunately, I'm one of those guys, Dave, that believe that the vote's going to be rigged, just like we saw the Scottish independence vote. I believe that was rigged. Uh, the polls are now swinging in favor of those that want to exit uh, the EU, and I think it'd be great. I think that countries, personally speaking, need to go back to sovereignty, need to understand that it's great to trade with other countries, but you know, there's a reason why the UK is the UK and Europe, you know, and France is France, and Germany is Germany. And what we're seeing is, you know, again, internationalists like Hillary Clinton, um, like David Cameron, like the, you know, unelected bureaucrats that run the EU, they are somewhat sold thinking that, no, if we come together, if we actually in, intertwine our economies even more, that that somehow is going to be great. Well, look at the look at the growth rates for the EU. I mean, look at the fact that, the UK needs to, in essence, continue to bail out and keep these Eastern European countries on life support that are poor. It, it just doesn't work out for the people in the UK. And I think that it'd be great if they left. It'd be a great example for, uh, for sovereignty or, uh, around the world. I just, I just think that the vote's going to be rigged. I agree with you. I, I think the vote most likely will be rigged. Even if they do vote to exit, I mean, look what happened in Greece. They voted for a brand new government. Cyprus promised them everything that they wanted, and then he turned on the people. Right. <laughs> I mean, he went along with whatever the central banks said, what the ECB said, what the IMF said, went along with that, and here Greece is, you know, in more debt than ever. Nothing's improved there whatsoever, and we're looking at the UK here, and I agree with you. I, I don't think the government is going to say, oh, you want to leave? No problem. We're going to listen to the people and we'll just let you leave. I, I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's going to happen, too. And, you know, even what I find interesting is that the, uh, the, the, the newest or not newest, but the conspiracy theory proven fact, which is uh, a Bilderberg group that comes together every year. One of the topics at the conference this year was that idea of the precariat, which is, in essence, People that are disenfranchised, people that have been let down, people that can't, that are struggling to pay the bills, people whose wages haven't gone up. And I think when you combine that, that consensus from the world elite and kind of beginning to get freaked out that there's this rise in individuals that are understanding their fraud and that are no longer believing their lies. And you combine that with the rise of nationalism really around the world, from the Philippines to India to the United States, all over, they're freaked out. They're absolutely freaked out. And I think that the kind of the, the, the line's been drawn in the sand with this Brexit vote. I think that they will pull out all the stops to keep the UK in there. And if the UK does leave, I think they're going to do everything they can to punish them economically, to set an example. If the votes are rigged, like we're talking about, and the government, the EU, decides, you know, we're not going to let this happen. Do you think the people will just sit back and say, ah, oh, you know what, okay, we had the vote, we're not leaving, that's fine. Or do you think the people in the UK are going to say, hey, wait a minute, this whole thing was rigged, 
I'm a little angry about this. Do you think this would lead into riots, uh, or do you think this would lead into something happening there? You know, it's that's a, that's a real interesting question. I think that event that you're talking about, Dave, is is going to happen. Perhaps, maybe not this time around in the UK, but the fact of it, it, very well, it could be in it could be in Philadelphia, it could be in Cleveland, where you know the people, the the will of the people is completely shut down by the powers that be and people just lose total control. So that those types of events I think are coming going back to the Bilderberg conference talking about the precariat. Uh with respect to the UK, you know, it, that's what people were talking about if if they screwed over the Scottish independence vote, I there's all kinds of evidence that MI6 MI5 was involved in in rigging that election and you saw nothing happen. And 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 the truth is is that the uh, in places like the UK, you know, the government has the guns and the people have baseball bats. So it's kind of a tough, you know, uphill battle. Uh, one of the reasons why every time you see like this horrible event we saw in Orlando, right. it's not about a, you know, a psychopath that killed people. No, it's about gun control. It's not about border control. It's about gun control. Um, and uh, and there's a reason behind that. And that reason, I believe, and why they keep pushing the gun control is directly tied to how frail and fragile the economy is, not just in the United States, but I think around the world. Talking about guns and events, we see many things happening out in the Pacific, in the Middle East, of course, <laughs> out in uh, Eastern Europe. And we continually see all these incidences with uh, China out in the South Pacific, with Russia, with you know, the the planes flying into certain areas, subs sailing into the English Channel. Are we on track for war? You know, it's a crazy, crazy topic, Dave, right? I mean, I, you know, and, and if somebody listening today is maybe just started listening to your channel and most of what they've exposed themselves to has been mainstream media, you hear that and you're like, no, that's never going to happen. But you know, it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunately likely to happen. And it's one of those things, quite frankly, like most of the things that we've talked about on this interview, I hope I'm totally wrong about. I don't want these things to happen. You know, I have two small kids. I want them to grow up with peace and prosperity. The simple fact is though, is that you have such incompetence on the world stage today. It reminds me, it's reminiscent of World War One. Uh, and, and really everything we've talked about today, economically speaking, ties right into geopolitics and really ties into this like reset of the total economic order of really the world order. And I think that, let's say, for example, the U.S., Europe begin to really go down in flames. Look, China has probably the leader in economic problems. However, everybody has economic problems. And I think what we could potentially see is, you know, countries, and we're already seeing it, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, coming together to try to kind of, you know, counterbalance the U.S. and Europe uh, and what they believe are more so Washington D.C. in this unipolar world where Washington thinks that they can make all the rules and everybody needs to follow them. So, so yes, I think that China is going to say, look, the U, you know, China's argument is pretty simple. The U.S. has 800 military bases around the world, troops in over 120 countries, a presence basically everywhere. China saying, look, we're going to expand into these islands that we're building and we're going to set up a Navy base. How can really the U.S. be the moral high ground on that conversation? I don't think they can. And, you know, ultimately we'll, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. But it's one of those things, Dave, where it's just one little mistake, man, whether it's jets collide, whether whatever it may be that could lead to a really ugly situation really quickly. One little thing that happens could just kick off the entire uh, event where it just has a chain reaction and you know they tell us that we're in war do you think they would they're, they're doing all of this to cover up for the economic problems well whether it's to cover it up or not i think it's potentially something that could be used in kind of a you know wag the dog uh, kind of a situation where they will use war to uh to to basically get out of um people freaking out about the economy you know 
we talk a lot of people are talking about war in the Middle East or, or, or war in you know, the South China Sea, and I've talked about it a lot as well. One of the scariest things, I think, is over the last couple of weeks in light of, and, and again, more so in light of these, uh, this, this horrible incident in Orlando, we have neoconservatives in Congress and in Senate wanting a declaration of war against ISIS. They want to declare war. And during the war time scenarios, we know federal government almost always has made limitations and restricted the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Tenth Amendment, the Fourth and Fifth Amendment. And I think that's what's the scariest thing, Dave, quite frankly, is that, you know, that war on terror, to quote John McCain, could last 100 years. Or if it's a declared war, that's their in to really begin to trample constitutional rights and liberties. And uh, and so I think that's a really, really scary development. In fact, I'm more concerned about that than really anything in the South China Sea. I do see them continually uh, trying to remove the rights of the people. I think this is their end goal is actually to get rid of the Constitution. Uh, I think their their end goal is to try to convince people. And we can see it with our young with Common Core and things like that, where they're teaching them that rights are privileges, they're not, you know, rights that you're born with, and they're actually rewriting some of the, uh, uh, some of the amend the uh, rights, uh, like the first, and the second <clears throat> amendment, um, the fourth amendment. They're they're continually rewriting it and rewording it and making it seem like you know this is what it's supposed to be. You don't have to really look at the real writing of these amendments to look at our new uh, version of it and that kind of scares me because it seems like they're on this track of brainwashing our young to convince them that you know the constitution your rights really doesn't mean anything today yeah it's i mean it's it's a that is extremely frightening you know it's uh whether look whether one's an atheist or they believe in god it really doesn't matter our founders were pretty clear we have unalienable rights they're they're, they're given to us by our creator among those. And then they list the different rights. So we had the right to bear arms, the freedom of speech among those. But there was a list of a bunch of other rights as well that the founders believed in that we were born with these rights. So government or a king or a dictator could not take the rights away because we were born with them. And one of them is, for example, the right to bear arms, the right to protect ourselves. And we see, I mean, a lot of, you know, this is in essence, refers to natural law. You walk into a bear cave and you approach a couple bear cubs, the mama grizzly bear is going to rip your head off and kill you. It's just, that's the way it works, right? You come into my house at night, try to hurt my kids. I'm going to kill you. That's the reality of the situation. And that's a right that I think every American should have. But this government is so out of their minds, they believe different. And you're absolutely right, Dave. If people begin, look, there was a, a couple years back, I saw a poll where something like 26% of high school students did not know the country that the U.S. separated from in the American Revolution. So, of course, if they don't know their history, of course, they could say, yeah, the Constitution's outdated. It's old. We need a new, you know, we need privileges. We need a new, you know, Declaration of Independence. And people will go along with it. It's pretty scary. It is. And a lot of people have been predicting that the second half of this year we're going to see some type of economic problem. Some others are saying it's going to happen in the spring of 2017. What is your take on where you things are headed? Well, I'm more a 20. I'm more of a 2017 individual, um, and uh, I, I'm more of a 2017 individual for the simple reason that I think that the uh, the elite, the powers that be, the banksters on Wall Street, even the central bankers are all in the bag for Hillary Clinton. If we saw economic fallout prior to that, it would hurt her chances of re-election and it would go against the, uh, you know, the delusional comments of Barack Obama saying this is the best recovery ever and the economy is doing wonderful. So I think that they will continue to keep this going uh, to get her elected. And then afterwards, if the economy implodes, She's the person they'll want in there because she'll, you know, say, look, we need to spend trillions of dollars. We need to stimulate the economy, which is basically a boondoggle for the uh, for the one percent of one percent. Uh, so that's what I think. Uh, I, I'm more of a 2017 guy. There's no telling. And I'll tell you this, too, Dave. Mm. You know, a lot of people have thought, look, the Fed's out of ammunition. The truth is, is they're not. They have bigger guns that they could roll out. 
I've mentioned helicopter money. People should look into what it is. It's not quantitative easing. Again, you have a lot of high net worth billionaires that are talking about how the government needs to do this. The central bank needs to do this. And again, it would look like the Fed printing literally trillions of dollars and either injecting that into the economy via tax cuts for some, which they may do, but also giving the money to the bank, knowing that the bank's going to turn around and inject it right into the economy through easy credit, through loans and what have you, hopes that that will boost the economy and get things going. It's an absolute nightmare situation. So I think there's more things that they have in their toolkit uh, outside of black swan events that could just destroy everything that will keep this thing this Ponzi scheme and this zombie economy rolling.